What are we building? What are we building? That is what we're going to look at today as we look at the Old Testament, jump into the New Testament, and as we go back to the Old Testament. As we think about September, our goal has been to think about ministry and serving. If you remember the first Sunday we began this series, I spoke about the responsibility of we who are shepherds and the responsibility to serve you and the responsibility to carry out the things that God says about shepherds in his word. Last week, we had the opportunity to honor Pastor Larry Katz, who is now our uh, pastor emeritus. And uh, that responsibility is one of wisdom. That responsibility is one of someone just coming alongside myself and the other pastors to encourage us and for us at times to call on him because of his ministry experience to help us. But in that process, Dick and Connie Schuff were also recognized, and we tried to convey to you that here were examples of people who have given their lives to the Lord. And the many years of serving is an example for us who are coming behind that we continue to serve. Today we're focusing on service from the standpoint of what are we doing as a church, or more than that, what are we doing as a body of believers when we leave this building on Sunday morning, and what is the world really seeing? Are people hearing us talk about Jesus? Are we interested in sharing the gospel with people and helping them to understand that the depravity of this world needs a savior? Are we following up with other believers, encouraging them, praying with them, helping them, maybe discipling them on a personal level? Are we taking what gifts and abilities and talents and passions that God has given us and are we using them to build something for the kingdom of God? When I take you back to Genesis chapter 11, we find that there were a group of people who were building for themselves. So we're going to start there and see the outcome of building for yourself. When we look at Genesis chapter 11, we're looking at verses 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people uh, migrated from the east, they found the plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitum for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we dis be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the whole earth. So here we see in Genesis chapter 11, we see the ability of man. God saw the ability of man, and you and I today in our own culture, we see the ability of man. Man works to figure things out. Man tries to analyze. Man puts together thoughts. Man decides that with his own, in his own strength and by his own power, he will be able to create something, build something that will provide generation upon generation to live. And the one thing that we have learned to do in our culture, like many cultures do around the world, we have forgotten to include God in what we're doing. We have taken God out of the picture and we have decided we're more educated. Uh, we have more reasoning power. We have the ability to think better. Uh, we are going to analyze with purpose. And God, we really don't need you. And so we're going to set you over here and we're going to build our own Ephesus. And then God came down and he confounded and he confused people and they moved on to the face of the whole earth. 
And so when I think about building today, the one thing I realize for us as a church in this culture, this American culture, is that we need to have God in the center of what we're doing. Because if we don't have God in the center of what we are doing as a church, we will fail. We will come to ruin and we will have a lot of uh, ability to put out some muscle for a short period of time, but it is God who sustains. And so I want to encourage you and me today that in the American culture right now in this 21st century, you and I, I have the greatest opportunity to be light to the world. We have the greatest opportunity to reach people for Christ. We have the greatest opportunity to help believers grow in their faith. And that brings me to the New Testament and where we will spend the morning in Ephesians chapter 4. Tomorrow night on Deeper Dive, I'm going to take you through the whole six chapters of the book of Ephesians in about 30 minutes. So it will be a very high overview. But this morning, I want to zoom in and I want to look at Ephesians chapter 4. And there are several things that I want to share with you this morning that hopefully will encourage you and me that in this culture we live in, the Christian has the opportunity to speak into the lives of fearful, hurting people. We have the opportunity to speak into the lives of a confused people. We have the opportunity to speak into the lives of people who are walking in darkness because we are the light of the world. And as the light of the world, we have the opportunity in the 21st century to take the powerful message of Jesus Christ and help people understand there is hope. There is a better way. There is light. There is a place that can lead us to where we are set free, and that is in the person of Jesus Christ. But the only way I'm going to be able to talk to my unsaved friends, and the only way I'm going to be able to help someone else grow in the Lord, is if I have a perspective that doesn't get caught up in the polarization of this world, but realize that my kingdom, my Lord, is far above this planet. And it is my responsibility because I am a child of the king, his ambassador in this world, to help people see the light of Jesus and what the word of God can say to help them. But when I act and become entangled in the affairs of this world, I will not be strong in my light and I will not be strong in my faith because most of the time it leads to a polarization. And I need to make sure that I'm not caught up in the cunning craftiness of the devil who likes to split and tear and kill and confuse and destroy where God wants to save and unify and bring together and strengthen as one. And we see that all through the Word of God. So let's jump in here and learn how to do these things today. We find, first of all, that we need to build into our lives to show the 21st century American culture what success is like. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 2 and 3. I'll jump back and read verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Then verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There are six characteristics here that the Apostle Paul names and God gives us in this portion of Scripture. When I think about being that person in the 21st century American culture that is going to have an influence, my manner of living has to be different than what we're seeing in the media, reading about in periodicals and newspapers. We have to be different than what Facebook throws out and what social media throws out. We need to be a different people. And God wants us to be a different people. And so he gives us six things here to look at. Number one is humility. You hear a lot of people talk about humility. Humility is thrown around so much it means nothing anymore. But I heard someone uh, say this. I wrote this down here. Uh, I said I heard, I read. Making ourselves small is pride in the disguise of humanity, uh, humility. Making ourselves small is really pride 
when we think about human, uh, humility. You see, I can walk around, hang my head, fold my hands, and tell you how humble I am. I can walk around and tell you that I live this life of humility and, oh, I'm such a small person. I'm such an insignificant person. When if I really judge my heart most of the time, where's the focus still on me? And there isn't really humility. I'm creating something that looks like humility, but it is not humility. Humility is a, not, is a true estimate of ourselves. What is my model for humility? My model for humility is Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 9. I won't turn there, but I'll paraphrase some of those verses. Jesus took on himself the form of a man, and being made in likeness as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him. When you and I want to think about humility, we need to go to Philippians chapter 2. When we really want to examine our hearts to see if we are people of humility, we need to go to Philippians chapter 2 and look at the life of the Lord Jesus. The second thing mentioned here is gentleness. Gentleness it is the idea of submissiveness to the control of God when I act toward other people. Because you know what I want to do in the flesh? You know what we see on Facebook this morning? You know what we see? We see cursing and evil and division and hatred. And we see all types of disunity. What does God say? If I'm going to build right, Genesis Church is going to build right. If we're going to build right, we need to be a people who are gentle. We need to be able to be a people who say, I will submit myself under control that God might be glorified. How can I bring that down to a practical level? And somebody might say, okay, preacher, you have now crossed the line. You've gone from preaching to meddling. You know how we practice gentleness? If I don't want to wear a mask and someone wants to wear a mask, I don't mock them. That's gentleness. That is the submissiveness to the Spirit of God and when someone is at a different place than I am. And maybe that's my soapbox as your lead pastor, but folks, I'm getting tired of seeing Christians play evil on social media when it comes to issues like that. I'm getting sick of that. And I don't want Genesis people to be like that. I want us to be strong people who are reaching out, who are really living a way that is going to honor God. Another thing here is patience. And that is slow to avenge wrong. Slow to avenge wrong. Well, I'm going to get you back. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I don't like what you're doing. I'm going to burn your city down. I'll get you back. I'll burn your neighborhood down. That is not the characteristic of a Christian. That is not what God is showing here. God is saying that I need to be slow to avenge wrong. There are ways that wrong is avenged. There are ways that we have in our system of government, in our system of the church, in society, where there's a process. And when I take it upon myself to rise up and I will carry out the judgment of God, I have put myself in the wrong place. And so we have to be careful about patience, love. Love is the idea of the sphere of love. It's the idea that what all Paul is talking about here in these uh, six things in verses 2 and 3, love is the idea of sphere. That in every way that I'm operating, there is that spirit of love. God is saying, I want my children in the 21st century in crazy American culture right now, I want them to attack this world with the sphere of love. I want them to attack this world with my love and who I am to a lost and dying world. That's our mission. That's our mission. And I'm not going to be a good soul winner. And I'm not going to be a good discipler. If what, I am not, if what I am doing is not wrapped in the sphere of love, 
Just think of a garment wrapping around you. Think of a big, comfy blanket on this cold morning. If you got up real early in the morning, they put a big, wrapping that blanket around you. That's the idea there, the sphere of love. I am wrapping that around my whole being. I want the world to see that I'm different. And then unity. Unity is a zealous effort to maintain oneness in biblical things. Unity is about us striving to live a life that promotes what God says. What does God say in his word? What does God want us to do? You and I are unified. The world is going to see the Christian community is not divided. The Christian community understands John 17. The Christian community is going to move together. The Christian community is going to respond in a way where the world sees we're reacting differently because you and I are going to be unified in the things of God. We're going to be unified in the things of Christ. And then the bond of peace is a bonding factor. Peace is a bonding factor. What is going to be the glue to these five things I just mentioned? Peace, because it's going to bond everything together. It's going to hold us together. And so as we look at the 21st century today, and we look at chaos today, and we see all that is going on, today the world is fighting over a justice of the Supreme Court who has passed away. And what we have real not, or failed to realize is, who is the one that takes life? It is God. God says our days are numbered. God knew this justice of the Supreme Court was going to die. He knew that. But what don't we know as humans in this world, we pick up to start to fight. And it just shows our heart. It shows our heart. So we got to judge our heart. We have to make sure that we're not out there creating a war zone, but we're creating peace. When I look at the next thing, as I look at scripture, I realize that let's strive to show the 21st century American culture what solidarity looks like in our oneness. What does that look like? Paul goes on to say down in the next few verses, beginning in verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. What I see here is that God is a unifier. God is one who is seeking oneness. God wants us to operate in the oneness that he demonstrates in the Trinity. When we look at the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we don't see discord. We don't see things that are out of control. We don't see God in kind of a confused state. We see unity. We see the Godhead setting an example for us what oneness can do, what oneness is all about, and what can be achieved through oneness. And so he gives us a list here. There is one body in Christ. We are one body in Christ. What I fear today is that when the world looks at the church, why in the world do I want to get saved how they're treating each other on social media? Why do I want to get saved when I see them cursing each other out? They're doing the same things I do. Oh my goodness, my dear friends, we need to be a church and a people of God that sees that God desires us not to be a divider, not to tear down. God wants us to see that we are in one body, Jesus Christ. That as we realize he is our leader, as we realize that he is the one we're serving, as we realize he is the one that we need to follow we are saying as a church, we're going to show this messed up world. We're going to show hurting people. We're going to show abusive people. We're going to show all kind of people that Jesus Christ can make a difference. And if I have the ability to treat someone with decency, I may have the ability to sit down with them in a coffee shop or my living room or backyard and share with them the hope that Jesus offers. But if I'm cursing out you on social media, if I'm telling you all kind of nasty things out there, I lost my testimony. I lost my testimony. And so we need to have that oneness, one Holy Spirit. We need, we talked about that power of the Holy Spirit. The church needs to feel the Holy Spirit fall on her again. The Holy Spirit needs to be that power that we allow to move in our lives and in our hearts that the work of God can get done. One common hope, a calling that inspires 
We have hope. We can, we can give people more than what the world can. The world can't give eternal life. The world can't offer hope beyond the grave. The world can't offer any type of peace when people try to lay down on their pillows at night and are tossing and turning because there's so much angst in their heart. But we have a message of Jesus Christ. We have one hope. We have one ability to share with people that lives can be changed, that people can be transformed. One Lord Jesus Christ. One faith in common salvation. One baptism, the common sign of that faith that we have trusted Jesus, and one God and Father over all. When I look at the Word of God, the Apostle Paul is saying here, if I'm going to be effective in my culture, if I'm going to reach people in a way that is going to touch their lives, whether they're lost, whether they're just needing help in their faith, if I can be that instrument, I need to be at the place where I understand oneness, that who we are as a church. Genesis Church has the ability to be different in the 21st century culture. I challenge you that you take your Facebook and turn it into the pulpit of God. I challenge you that you take your Facebook and rise up with the righteousness of the Lord. There will be a difference. There will be a difference. And sometimes it's just taking a little creative thought. The other day I put something on Facebook. I found a picture of the scrolls of the Old Testament, probably in the museum in, in London, England. And, and I saw the scroll there and I talked about the Word of God. That's all you need to do. Find ways to talk about hope. Find ways to talk about the Word of God. Don't get caught up in all of the garbage how the world operates. Because we're above the world. Because we have a God who's above the world. And we need to rise up and we need to serve our God. When I think about uh, the scripture, I think about a third thing. And that is developing discipleship mentality. You hear a lot about discipleship. We have Genesis University. We have Deeper Dive. We have Embracing the Moment. We have Self-Confrontation. We have the Daniel Plan. We have, we have so many discipleship things whereby we can grow. And in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 and verse 16 we see here that God has provided a better way for the 21st American culture. Look with me at verse 11. And he gave the apostles he gave the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds or pastor teachers. We see here a core. That's the first thing I see. The discipleship mentality that God established began with a foundational core. It began with the apostles. It, it was carried on by the prophets. It was continued on with the evangelists. And it's established with the pastor's teachers. The idea of pastor's teachers in the original language is one word. In our English Bible, they separate it with that three-letter word called and. It's really not two different distinct things that Paul is talking about here. Now, he talks about teachers in other portions of the Bible, but here it is pastor-teacher. So you have a core. God has given us the Word of God. God has given us the ability to have it established. In 1 Peter chapter uh, 2, verse 6, it says, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is part of that foundation. I know nothing about building a building. I drive down Zarfoss Road and I see him putting up that big warehouse. And I saw all those brick people putting up brick. Do not ask me to build anything with brick because it will be really weird, okay? And it might fall over. But if you're a mason and you understand mason work, you understand the value of the cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the church and upon him are the apostles and the prophets and upon them are the evangelists and the pastors and teachers. Why is it built this way? Look at verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. What is the outcome of the core? There are several things that we find listed from verses uh, 11 all the way down to 16. I'm going to throw them out to you here and give them to you. Number one, the outcome is bringing the believer to a place of spiritual fitness. When you look at those verses, what does it say? The core, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, teachers. What is their job? To help believers do the work of the ministry, equipping them. The word equipping them is a fitness plan. The word equipping them is a fitness plan. 
And that's exactly what we're talking about. Now, we all might do fitness stuff, okay? If you're like me, the one thing that from March until about two months ago until Planet Fitness opened, we, we all probably did something that we had in common. We gained weight, okay? <laughs> we were in our house and we ate. Nothing else to do but let's eat, okay? So now, you know, so the other day I mowed the grass. That's 45 minutes. I thought, I got to get the plan of fitness. I got to get it. So I did an hour on the treadmill, you know, and, and boy, oh, day did Friday. I feel it right here in these knees as a 63-year-old, okay? But you know what? I know that if I'm going to be strong physically, I have to push. I have to push. And yesterday when I didn't feel like going, I had to go. I had to work out on that elliptical. I had to pick up those weights because if I'm going to keep this temple in some kind of shape, I have to work hard. That's the same example of that word there, equipping the saints. It is the idea of working hard. It is the idea of a spiritual fitness plan. So discipleship, I need to grow in my faith. I need to become strong. Let's face it, we have a lot of people out there who know absolutely nothing about the Bible who go to church. And then they get called up with an unsaved person who is a good debater, can reason everything, their direction, and that believer just stands there and says, well, all I know is I'm saved. You know, it is really interesting when you go back and look at church history, there was a time in the early 1900s when the liberalization of Europe came over into the church and the Bible movement, the fundamental movement really took hold and it was a movement to get back to the word of God. It was a movement to get back to the things of God and then from there by the time you get into the 1950s you hear of a man called Billy Graham and you see the evangelical movement take hold and the idea of getting the gospel out to many people, sharing the gospel in different ways and in different venues. It was the idea that people needed to get back to the word of God. People needed to get back to the word of God. Today, we do not know for the most part in Christianity in the Western world how to handle the word of God. We don't know how to study it. We don't know how to apply it. And we don't know how to help someone with it. We got to get back, and that's why Genesis Church is going to become strong in discipleship. We need you when you leave here and you hear the teaching of the Word of God and you are equipped to do the work of the ministry. You're the ones out there on the front lines, and you know the Word of God, and you're strengthened in the Word of God. You know how to use the Word of God. So when you come up against the enemies of God, instead of running and hiding, you're able to stand. And you're able to stand knowing that you can talk about in a very rational, civil way, you can talk about the Word of God. My son told me something I thought was really interesting. A couple weeks ago when we were talking on the phone, he said, you know, Dad, he said, there's this atheist friend that I have. And he doesn't know the Lord, but I will meet with him at times for coffee. And we will talk about the world and I will talk about where God is and, and, and God's role. And, and there he sits with the atheist in the coffee shop and he begins a dialogue. I'm so proud of that boy because he's doing it well. He's doing it well. And he's out there and he's trying to take the word of God and put it in situations with people where he sits and talks with them rather than throwing something at them. And he sees them as a human being that Jesus died for. And he spends time like Jesus stood at the well with the woman. And when Jesus went into the sinner's house where the party was, just having the opportunity to say, I'm a Christian. This is what I believe. But I love you enough to talk with you and to sit with you. That is going to go far more forward than if he's cussing his atheist friend out on the internet. And so we find here that God encourages us. He encourages us to be service-oriented. We do the work of the ministry. It is the idea of being service-oriented. It creates body life. We're building up the body. We're helping each other get stronger. There are some of you out there who would be excellent Bible teachers, and you're just sitting here. You need to see Pastor Joe and start helping other believers. There are some of you that have a powerful gift of evangelism, and you do it well. You need to get involved and you need to find out ways this church can become evangelistic. 
and move forward into the community. It's a functioning body here. This body working together is moving forward. It is building itself up. It is also moving ahead in the process. When you look at verse uh, uh, 12, let's jump back to verse 12. Equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. That idea of attaining is a traveler with a destination in mind. That traveler knows where he's going. He has a road map. God has given us a road map as we serve him. We have the opportunity to go forward. We have the opportunity to follow God's plan. If I'm going to do it God's way, I'm going to have the opportunity to see God work. And so I need to follow that road map. I need to follow that path where we are able to move forward. And then I need to be strong so I'm not dizzy. Because when you look down at verse uh, 14, it says there, so that you're no longer tossed. That word tossed is the idea of not swinging from a point to point to where you're dizzy. He talks about the being on the ocean and being in the sea and, and the waves and back and forth. Talks about every wind of doctrine. Somebody brings a new thing in. Is it biblical? Is it godly? Is it focusing on Jesus? Is it, is it going to exalt you know, Christ and what he did on the cross in his resurrection? Or, or won't we know? And we're just kind of back and forth. Oh, I like this thing. No, I like this thing. Oh, I like this thing. You know what's going to help us grow in our faith? This thing. This thing, the word of God. And so we need to get back to the word of God. The word of God says, read the word of God. Meditate in the word of God. Let the word of God become a part of your life. The word of God is what is permeating your action. It is putting you on a course that is going to move you forward. And it creates stability in verse 14 because when we're not tossed, we are strong. We're not going to be moved around. And then it creates an atmosphere of truth. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. You see the key word there? Speak the truth in love. So if you meet with your atheist friend at the coffee shop, what do you tell him? You tell him the truth. God never says lie or compromise. He always says, tell the truth. But we do it in love. Remember that spirit of love, that sphere of love? We do it in love. So don't ever think being godly or, or, or kind of being in a, in a way where you're not offending people is biblical. No, being biblical is telling the truth. There's a way we tell the truth as believers. And I would agree, this culture that we live in does not know truth. We do need to share the truth. And there is a way to share the truth. It is in that sphere of love. And so we are to put on that characteristic. And so there we see in these verses that I can develop a discipleship mentality in my life that is going to benefit someone else. And as I become a strong disciple, I'm not going to be messed up. I'm not going to be led astray. I'm going to know what the Word of God says. I'm going to know what God wants me to do because I am anchored in the Word of God. God. It may sound very simple, folks, for you coming from me as your lead pastor, but I've said two of these things already. We are in this building and we are striving at this church to exalt one person and that's Jesus Christ. And we are in this building and our job is to know the word of God and that the word of God is preeminent and that the word of God comes over all culture. The word of God com comes over all nations. The word of God comes over all peoples because the word of God is the word of God. And we need to know the word of God. If you and I have a spirit of Lord Jesus Christ, my daily life is exalting you. Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God is going to be preeminent in my life. I want people to know the word of God. We're not going to have time to get caught up in other stuff because we are going to have the opportunity to talk to hopeless people. And that one-on-one -on -one conversation, that opportunity to speak to someone in that one-on-one -on -one way gives us the opportunity 
to speak into them the truth of God. And then the last thing here that I see is in verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. You say, Pastor Bob, why did you put that there? Because we need to demonstrate a better way. And I've been saying that all through this message. So I just kind of sat down and I wrote a couple things down here. Cursing, name calling, rioting, hatred over political differences, ethnic division, civil disruption, rebellion to authority, poking fun at people who think differently, segregation over school choice, destructive statements like lock them up, ship them out, don't move into my neighborhood. We see that on social media, but you know what scares me, my friend? Here's the meddling part again. There are people in the body of Christ who do those things. And these things ought not to be. These things ought not to be. Jesus came with a mission of drawing people to the cross. He came with a mission for us to be concerned about the lost and to reach people for him. I want to encourage you today, as I said 10 minutes ago, use your skill in writing. Use your skill in whatever it is you do on social media to show people a better way. A better way. They know how to do all the bad stuff. They need to learn how to do the good stuff. The light of the world. We need to be the light of the world. And so when we operate out of the old nature, you know, we sacrifice reaching people. We forget about the kingdom work we have to do, and we don't care about our culture. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We are to disciple, we are to baptize until the end of the age. That's the call that we have. We have a call to do. One of the reasons I put together that 10-day study of looking at the Word of God and for you and me to sit and reflect on the Word of God is because as we move into October and we talk about a polarized culture, I'm going to give you chapters over four weeks where you would pray over and you would ask God to show you how you can change, how you and I can change, how we can be different people so that we really can be an influence in our culture. Folks, it's going to get ugly come November 1. You are not dumb and neither am I. It's going to get ugly. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I do know what God mandates me to do, to be a light to the world, to share Jesus Christ, to do what is right. So that study time is to do that. Another thing that we're trying to do that I want to encourage you with is on September 26th, uh, Jonathan Kahn is leading a national prayer event on the nation's capital. Uh, I know we have a lot of activities going on here, but one nice thing about what he is doing is that you can watch it simulcast from your own house. Maybe you want to get a bunch of people together and, and have, you know, on Facebook they talk about watch parties. I really don't know what all happens in a watch party, but uh, maybe you want to have a house party. Maybe you just want to get people together and you want to do this. So these little cards are at the, uh, at the information uh, desk, and that gives you the email address. And you can even go on their website and see a whole lot of other information. But I want to just give you a tiny glimpse of that, so watch this video. This is Jonathan Kahn. We are standing at a pivotal moment in American history and world history, a moment that can permanently seal our nation's course and the course of the world for good, for bad, for calamity, or redemption. America and much of Western civilization was founded on a biblical foundation stone, but it's turned away from that foundation. We're going to start that we over, Michael. Okay, hold on, folks. The love of technology. I'm glad I don't know anything about it because I can't be critical then. Uh, <laughs> we're going to let that start again. But uh, I just want to encourage you to pray for our nation as well. We need a people to return to God, and we need to be praying to that end as well. And uh, so you'll be able to pick those things up, like I said, 
Andrew's book's back there. Jonathan Kahn's book is back there. It's only to help you. It's only to help you and get a perspective. Um, so those are things you can take advantage of. So as we're going to watch the video. So while they get that ready, we'll watch the video. And then the worship team's going to come take us out in a song. Pastor Jeff, I'll let you close us out as God leads you then after uh, the video. This is Jonathan Kahn. We are standing at a pivotal moment in American history and world history, a moment that can permanently seal our nation's course and the course of the world for good, for bad, for calamity, for redemption. America and much of Western civilization was founded on a biblical foundation stone, but it's turned away from that foundation. We have not only driven God out of our public life, and have called what is good evil and what is sin good. But we have sacrificed the lives of over 60 million unborn children. And America's fall from God is not only progressing, it's accelerating to the point that it's no longer just a falling away, but a war against the purposes of God. I wrote in the Harbinger of the signs of judgment that appeared in the last days of ancient Israel, warning of calamity, that these same signs of warning have now appeared on American soil. The biblical template concerning judgment is that the nation so warned is given a space of time to return or to head for judgment and calamity. We are now in that window of time. But if America continues on its present course, that window will come to an end and there will come a flood that will begin the end of religious freedom even usher in persecution and seal America's fall. And if America falls, it will affect the entire world. This is the announcing of the return, the national and global day of prayer and repentance. It will be a day and more than a day, a time and a season for the movement for prayer, repentance, return and revival. The central day will be Saturday, September 26th, in a sacred assembly, according to what is laid forth in Scripture, to take place in our nation's capital on the Washington Mall. For those who can't make it or want to do something where you are, then gather together in your states, your cities, in your towns, in your houses of worship, in your homes, or be part of those gatherings already planned. This will take place not only 40 days before the presidential election, but also on the 400th anniversary of the sailing of the Mayflower in the days of America's founding and dedication to God. And surrounding the day of return on September 26th will be 10 days known from ancient times as the 10 days of repentance, starting with the Feast of Trumpets and ending on the Day of Atonement to set as a special time to intensify our prayers, our intercessions for repentance and revival. September 18th to September 28th. Believers and leaders who are already part of the return include everybody from Pat Robertson to Dr. James Dobson, from Billy Graham's daughter, Anne Graham Lotz, to Martin Luther King's niece, Alveda King, and many, many more. When does the return begin? Right now. How? With you and me as we commit this time and this year for return, prayer, repentance, and revival. To commit first to our own repentance and to begin actually living in revival. And then to pray for others, the return and revival of our nation and the world. The movement and chance we have before us now may never come again. If we don't return now, we may pass the point of no return. So now, in view of the calling and of the moment before us, let us each rise to that call to do what he has called us to do, to believe for great and mighty things we know not of, to return and seek to live in revival and become messengers of revival. It's time to break up our fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord as never before. It's time to return.